Okay, um, uh, welcome everyone. Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, and um, uh, this is uh, another episode of our Copy with Curiosity in our uh, online avatar, Curiosity During Quarantine. Uh, we hope that uh, we will be able to soon emerge from this quarantine avatar to back to Copy. Uh, but uh, till then, uh, we uh, we continue for a few more episodes, at least uh, in this mode. And uh, I'm very happy that today, uh, Prasarandam Ghosh uh, uh, has agreed to give uh, today's talk on the exciting topic of quantum matters, uh, uh, quantum matter, and well, since quantum matters. Uh, but uh, uh, you, you'll hear... Uh, uh, about uh, uh, Arundam from uh, Vijay. We'll give an introduction to him. I just wanted to say a few words about uh, KDK and uh, uh, ICTS. Uh, so Copy with Curiosity, as uh, was the original avatar, uh, is jointly done with the planetarium in um, the Jawaharlal Nehru Planetarium in the city. Uh, and uh, we've been uh, having a very uh, nice uh, uh, joint venture for around five years now. Uh, and uh, uh, it was very nice to have these in-person ones in the planetarium, uh, which we will hopefully return to. Um, but uh, K, uh, K, this KWK is only one of our many outreach uh, activities. Uh, and uh, we have in this online avatar, uh, started a few more, uh, a few more such online activities and outreach, and you might have heard of uh, Vigyan Adda, and we have one coming up very soon, also by one of our colleagues at IASC, Professor Rohini Godbule, on uh, Steven Weinberg, who uh, the eminent physicist who passed away recently. Uh, so we uh, began at Dai is a series aimed at undergraduate students and uh, so on who want to know a little bit more about some uh, uh, frontier topics in uh, uh, in research and. Um, uh, apart from KDK, we also have Einstein lectures. We have had uh, several lecture series, all of which are available on our YouTube channel. So if you look at ICTS talks, uh, uh, if you just type in as one word, you will find our YouTube channel. You can subscribe to it and you'll see, uh, you'll find yourself uh, getting a lot of uh, uh, very high quality content on a number of areas, not only in physics, but also mathematics, computer science, biology, and uh, something like KWK is actually very, uh, very wide in its scope. And we've had uh, things on uh, uh, metallurgy. We have had a lot of uh, very interesting topics. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so outreach is one of the activities that ICTS takes very seriously, uh, and you can look at our webpage for a list of all the past uh, ones. Uh, we recently hosted a new series uh, called uh, uh, Technology and Cosmic Frontiers in cooperation with the Office of the principal scientific advisor uh, to the government of India. And this featured Kip Thorne and Rana Dikari uh, from Caltech uh, talking about the opportunities in gravitational wave science, especially for India. If you miss that, again, I would direct you to our webpage to catch the video recording. So ICTS, apart from outreach, of course, we have a lot of programs in a uh, number of areas in the sci theoretical sciences. Um, and uh, again, the contents of these programs, these lectures are available on our YouTube channel. So those of you who are students and trying to go into research, you will find a lot of useful uh, in pedagogical material, as well in some of our schools and so on, on uh, uh, advanced topics. Um, and uh, finally, ICTS has its own in-house research with a very active uh, graduate program. And, and uh, those of you who, who are planning to pursue PhDs, uh, you should consider ICTS as an option when you give your uh, 
jest exam and so on so uh, so that's uh, um, a little bit about icts let me now um, uh, hand it over to vijay to introduce the speaker and to get on with the program today thank you rajesh uh, welcome everyone uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, professor arindam ghosh uh, arindam ghosh is a professor at uh, professor of physics at the indian institute of science in uh, bangalore his research interest involves fundamental understanding of physics and device concepts in multiple two dimensional electron systems with emphasis on transport optical and thermal properties of layered membranes the emphasis of his research lies in ultra sensitive optical detection tunable thermoelectric designs power efficient memory devices for neuro neuromorphic applications as well adam's group was one of the first to show uh, strong light matter interaction in the binary heterostructures of graphene and transition metal di chalcogenides and also to measure electrical noise in atomically thin two dimensional systems so far arindam has guided nearly 20 phd students he serves on the editorial and advisory board of several international journals he has been the recipient of several uh, recognitions and fellowships including the swarna jayanti fellowship the indo us science and technology forum fellowship in nanotechnology the shanti swarup bhatnagar prize the oxford instruments young nano scientist award pk ayengar memorial award the jc bose fellowship and most recently the infosys prize for physical sciences uh, in 2020 last year so it's a pleasure to have uh, arindam speaking in our uh, curiosity during quarantine series uh, thank you arindam uh, the floor is yours arindam you muted okay can you hear me yeah good thank you vijay thank you rajesh uh, Well, I thank ICTS, the team of uh, Anupam, and uh, to get this here. And uh, well, I miss the crowd because I have attended uh, offline uh, Kapi with Curiosity a few times, uh, but it's a new experience, so it's a different time. So it's good to get on with it rather than wait for everything to get normal. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about something which is uh, happening. globally for last maybe really took momentum over the last couple of decades and and it looks like that it's here to stay uh, it's about quantum technologies okay? and uh, it's it's a it's it's an informal and it's a it's a broad topic today so i would like to give you a bird's eye view of this full field give the ex, it's ex, uh, you know um, why it's exciting uh, from a fundamental point of view and where is the technology taking us how will it change our lives uh, in the longer run okay so at the end of the day everything is uh, quantum right i mean you don't have uh, everything is determined or the properties of everything that we see around us is dominated by quantum mechanics gold which is a metal and the silicon which is an insulator or a semiconductor these are all determined by the fact that they are uh their quantum properties are slightly different in one material to the other connected to the lattice structure and so on so forth so not just materials but it's also devices for example if you look at the first field effect transistors which has got about 10 billion of them uh, in the in 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 uh, one of the core uh, processor in your laptops um they are all quantum mechanically driven in some manner or other so the question naturally arises that what is this new quantum that we are talking about and why and how is it any different from what has already been happening over the last nearly 100 years more than 100 years uh, when since the quantum principles started emerging oh uh, well i mean the new quantum probably started very popularly with these statements although um, there could be other opinion but for those of you who do not know quantum mechanics uh if you you don't need to be worried because if you think you understand quantum mechanics you do not understand quantum mechanics it's not said by me but person who probably started the revolution or the second quantum revolution in certain ways uh way back in the 1980s 80s okay um so to give you a flavor of what's the difference about it let's look at this uh slide uh when you started the first quantum uh, revolution which was in uh 19 early 1900s um with the einstein photoelectric effect the quantum the emergence of quantum mechanics that came out what we understood over the last 
120 years is, is how the quantum mechanics works. It's hidden aspects, how to analyze and how to look at the properties and interpret the properties on the basis of quantum mechanics. And so far, all the properties of matter uh, have been successfully demonstrated or explained by the quantum mechanics. And we have now been able to do a lot of predictive uh, analysis as well, which helps us to get some confidence that now is the time to engineer. And the engineering probably is what the second quantum revolution is about, probably starting around 1980s and then slowly gaining momentum and we will see where we are today. Now, what we normally engineer, we engineer from quantum physical aspects, new kind of devices and systems. Uh, these new systems uh, and devices are usually depending on, uh, they usually use uh, manipulation and control of some of the elementary excitations or elementary particles, uh, photons, we all know it's light, electrons, it's carries charge, neutral atoms or charged atoms, atoms in general, uh, and then a definite class of materials which these excitations or particles can be manipulated in and that material platform is also an integral component of this emerging uh, quantum technologies. Okay. Now with these four different areas, what we now have been able to achieve by looking at the engineering aspect, there are three different directions. One is we are now getting disruptive functionalities, which was simply not possible before we started engineering quantum mechanics in these you know, materials uh, with where we are engineering the photons, electrons, and atoms, we are getting sensitivity of these functionalities to, be, to an unprecedented level, and that's what I'm going to explain to you. And also there are certain activities will be sped up. There, there will be enormous amount of speed that, that could be ensured in these kind of uh, you know, structures and devices, okay? So in order to when we go into this, let's try to understand what the first quantum revolution led to over the last 100, 120 years to see how we slowly transcended from understanding quantum mechanics to the engineering of quantum mechanics. Okay. So if you, this is relatively um, ill-defined, but we can probably take a, a guess of, well, let's assume that okay, 1900, when Planck's black body radiation probably the start in some form because it started giving the particle nature uh, of, of photons, we started understanding, okay, there is quantum light. Okay, so let's start from that point. Uh, soon after that, the Einstein's photoelectric effect came in with the electrons essentially getting knocked out by photons and essentially the scattering of the particle description of waves started coming in. Not soon after, somewhere around 1920s, the Broglie wave uh, particle duality came through. That's the almost like the birth of quantum mechanics, where you expect you you take a particle of mass m and velocity v, and you describe the same in a different area, uh, different area as or, 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 or the representation of wave. You connect the wavelength of that matter wave from its mass and velocity. Okay, so we have a wave particle duality picture coming in. Soon, very soon after that, Schrodinger came out with the, with the quantum mechanical Schrodinger's equation, uh, which connected the energy and its evolution of this quantum state with time and the birth of quantum mechanics well, well and truly uh, in place. Um, but soon it was understood that, you know, in addition to, uh, you know, getting some of the understanding of the material properties and, and quantum states, you also have opened a Pandora's box in which there are weird properties are inherently engraved. For example, the Schrodinger's cat experiment, thought experiment, uh, in some sense, uh, EPR, Einstein, but also Rosenberg uh, paradox, which came roughly at the same time where it was shown that if you have to assume quantum mechanics, then you also have to uh, understand that there are hidden properties that are totally counterintuitive. And 
Schrodinger's cat essentially saying that you do not know whether the cat is inside a box which is alive or dead until, unless you open the box and see it. And that led to uh, a measurement related uh, debate, but Einstein came up with uh, another direction of quantum entanglement, which says that, okay, if you have to assume quantum mechanics is correct, you probably need to assume that the relativity theory uh, are at, is at odds with it because you need information transfer at speeds which is larger than speed of light. Turned out to be that's not the case, but that's later. But the, but the debate on the hidden properties of quantum mechanics started around 1930s, 19, uh, mid thirties. However, uh, in the meanwhile, the quantum mechanics of superconductivity was figured out by the blue BCS theory. Um, superconductivity of course was discovered in 1911, um, but the BCS theory is explained the microscopic picture somewhere around uh, 1957. The reason I incorporated this one is because today the leading a uh, player in the quantum computation is a superconductor based Josephson junction. So probably that started around 1957, over 64 years ago. However, in about six, seven years, uh, Bell's theorem actually showed that the spooky property or the hidden properties of quantum mechanics is probably correct and probably uh, is, is not completely against uh, the relativity theory. And what Bell's theorem did is that it gave us a way or, or, or certain methods or experimental methods in which one could test these spooky or hidden properties of quantum mechanics, in particular the entanglement between quantum particles, which are far away. Okay, uh, then a few years went by, the laser cooling started coming in and that started getting into new quantum system or the coherent states. Uh, not too far from then, about eight years later, the first demonstration of the C0 gate uh, was demonstrated, uh, uh, which is 1997. And C0 gate is a two qubit gate, which was uh, you know, one of the universal gates that's needed for the quantum computation. Um, and then 19, 2019, it's a quantum supremacy that was, uh, that was demonstrated by Google in, in the Sycamore. Processor. Of course, there are plenty of uh, events in between which led us to, to the state that we are in now. But, you know, these are roughly some, uh, it gives a flavor of how a pure understanding for over 50 to 60 years of a phenomena of a theory that slowly starts going from understanding to an implementation or engineering of new devices. Okay, so why it's interesting, why are we bothered about quantum technologies? So there are a few immediate applications that we are very excited by. And uh, one of the, for example, is ultra precise clocks, uh, extremely high uh, accuracy clocks, which have frequency stability in the orders of 10 power of minus 14, minus 15, uh, which can be used in navigation system, energy grids and financial um, transaction as well for clock synchronization. You need very strong clock uh, stability in order to, uh, for GPS, the global positioning system, for example, that's where navigation comes into play. Um, so these kind of very precise clocks are one of the key domains of quantum technology today. Uh, simulators, you have, uh, you, can, you can use uh, uh, simulator, quantum simulators for drug designs, designing new materials. So, and, and because inherently, it's a quantum mechanical simulation that makes a difference because after all, everything is quantum mechanical. So what's one of the major driving force of developing quantum technology uh, in the first place. Uh, sensors, I'm going to show you how uh, uh, you can make very interesting and sensors of that rely on completely different paradigm of functionality or mechanism. And uh, today uh, there are a very large number of sensors that are, that are being uh, you know, proposed. Medical imaging and uh, you know, medical applications in general is one of the directions that can be affected by quantum technologies. Um, I'm going to give you some examples here. The secured information exchange, the quantum key distribution, where you send information from one point to the other, which cannot be seen fundamentally or hacked or eavesdrop, uh, which is also one of the major directions which 
has been demonstrated now and, and a lot of uh, investments is going in, in secured quantum information transfer. And you see, last I kept at quantum computation, of course, quantum computation is one of the major directions which started the field in some sense, uh, where you have certain tasks uh, which will be exponentially quicker. But in addition to that, you have uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and big data handling. There are a lot of um, areas which can get immediately affected and immediately benefited by the quantum computation uh, protocols, algorithms, and so on. Okay, so if you take this overall applications, uh, there are primarily three directions in which uh, quantum technologies are, are moving in. Uh, I wanted to emphasize that uh, quantum computation is one of the key directions, but it is certainly not the only direction when it comes to quantum technologies. Quantum technology is a much bigger and vast subject. And I'm trying to, I'll share what I'll do. I'll try to give you a, a a flavor of the field as such, rather than going into one specific directions. In addition to these three, quantum computation, communication, and sensing, uh, they are dependent on and hence led to a very strong research in the materials and devices on which these three directions are going to be uh, implemented. Okay. So very quickly for those who might have seen a little bit, but if not, don't worry about it. I will go through uh, with as uh, simply as possible, but we can always uh, discuss later on the chat. Um, so overall the Schrodinger's equation, where, what is the quantum state? A quantum state is determined by this, um, let me just see the pointer option, yeah. By this equation where the Hamiltonian is essentially the energy and psi is what you call the quantum state. And this quantum state evolution in time is connected to its energy. And this is the Schrodinger's equation. What happened is the old quantum is our, our, our understanding part of it, which explain materials, metals, insulators, semiconductors. They depend on the net magnitude of psi or the wave function. For example, if there are certain energies where psi simply becomes zero, then you have a band gap and you usually end up with a semiconductor. Whereas if you don't have that, then you have probably a metal, okay? And there could be many states. In a material, there could be many quantum states. And these quantum states are the, which are essentially come as a solution to this uh, Schrodinger's equation, uh, usually are orthogonal to each other. They don't normally mix. Uh, and you can have a multiple states in a quantum system. Uh, usually that's where the engineering comes into play when you, are, when you are designing quantum devices, how many states and what their energies are, uh, they are usually taken into account in the designing aspects. Okay. Uh, but overall, the, the message here, the, what started in early 1900s is we started understanding different materials and different devices how to manipulate them, how to uh, you know, understand their physical properties and functionalities based on the property or the probabilities of electrons in the, or the charge in the system. Okay? And that is determined by the quantum state psi. However, the new quantum is dependent on some other set of properties. And uh, first is the quantum superposition. This is a little bit Hopefully it is not too much, but in detail. So please bear with me. If you have not seen it, I will give you a simpler explanation later if, as, as we go along. So if you have a quantum state, which can be in two, two states, zero and one, these are states, it's called a qubit. Uh, remember the states are essentially energy states, each electrons have got different, or eigenstates, which come as a solution to the Schrodinger's equation. What's interesting about a bit, a classical bit, is it can also stay in two states. Those are two classical states, zero and one, plus and minus one, and so on and so forth. In the case of a quantum bit, you have got two states, and your quantum state can stay in any linear superposition of these two states. For example, this is a sphere, and if the two poles of the sphere is zero and one, this quantum state, which is a vector, it can stay any of any point of this, sphere called the block sphere and, and psi is essentially a linear superposition of the state one and zero, okay? And that's called a qubit. 
And that immediately helps you to understand why certain tasks using qubit can be really, really fast. For example, you have got n classical bits, you can have each bit only as up and down, zero and one, minus or plus one. As a result, you have got n bits, there are two to the power of n configurations. However, if you have got n qubits, you essentially have infinitely number of possible states because each qubit can stay in a whole sphere where got alpha and beta can take any real value. Okay, and as a result, you have got uh, an exponent, very large Hilbert space or space uh, which can give real uh, allowed values of psi, and that can lead to exponential speed up in certain class of problems. And factorization of so Schur's algorithm is one of the uh, one of the examples. There are also sorting or the um, search algorithms, uh, Groverx, which gives you a quadratic speed up. So there are several algorithms now have come up, which can give you a, a real speed uh, in uh, comparison to classical uh, cases. And that is what has led to the drive of building a quantum computer, because in some cases, this can actually factorize the, factorize the uh, prime numbers, which is how crypto, uh, you know, in the, the many of the cryptographic, uh, you know, uh, processes are um, stored, for example, in uh, RSA, uh, you know, uh, protocols in which the passwords are used uh, to make, uh, are made using the fact, uh, products of prime numbers. So that's where, the, uh, that's where the scare comes into play, although that's only a part of the story. There is a large number of applicability of possible applicabilities of quantum uh, systems or computers that are driving this field. Oh, sorry. So the second is uh, measurement. You have uh, one of the neat aspect of quantum mechanics is that if you measure a quantum system, you essentially store it in one eigenstate or one state. It's a, if, once you open the box, you see the cat is either dead or alive, but before you open it, the system is a coherent superposition of the two states. And it could it will be essentially into in, in, a, in a mixed state, so to speak. Um, the third is the entanglement, and which is called the spooky action distance. We have two particles which are essentially mixed in uh, the two states, and once you uh, separate them out, you measure one, you automatically know what the state of the other will be. And I usually give this uh, uh, this, this cartoon. You have a two of the two systems which can stay in both. Um, state red and blue are two states. Both of them can stay in a mixed state uh, of two of them. You have a quantum physicist which essentially entangle them, for example, and once you entangle them, you put them into boxes, and then you send them into different planets, Jupiter and Mars. And then if you have a friend over there and the box is opened, remember the blue and the red are two eigenstates. And if the ball is, if it is open and it is found in the eigenstate of red or uh, blue, then the other one will have to be in red. Okay, so this is what is quantum entanglement. And this is what Einstein didn't like at all, because it was as if the information of has been transferred that this ball is red to this person over here instantaneously. Um, well, I mean, he made statements like if quantum theory is correct, it signifies the end of physics and science, but hopefully that was, thankfully that was not true. Um, but this actually led to unique uh, applications and quantum key distribution is an example. For example, if you take uh, two photons uh, and photons, again, I, I entangle them in uh, up and down directions. And uh, suppose you have a pair of entangled photons and you have two mobile phones and you want to know, uh, have a secured conversation between two mobile phones, you keep one entangled photon with yourself and send the other one to your friend with the other one, with the second mobile. Now you can keep on doing it as you, as you keep talking, you create series of entangled photons up and down for each you have a record. And as a result, there's a perfect correlation between the two uh, photons which are entangled with each other and you measure the correlation and ensure that no one has hacked. What if someone hacks? If someone starts looking at what you're talking about, the person will have to check the 
sign or the up, whether the photon is going through is up or down, or what is the polarization? Various ways you can you can uh, send this up and down information. But the according to the measurement, as I told you earlier, the moment you try to see whether the photon is up or down, you actually make it change because you collapse it in a, in a state which is unknown to this mobile, right? And that will immediately stop the correlation or, or destroy the correlation that you had between up and down photons between the two uh, communication devices. And you know that someone's happy. So this is one of the fundamental ways in which uh, or a secured quantum computation, a quantum communication can be exchanged or, 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 or carried out. Okay. Um, so as I said, these are the three directions of three pillars of quantum technology today. One is superposition, where you take a state and, and, and make them stay to two different, two different states. And the second is entanglement. And the third is measurement, these three, no cloning, that you cannot take a, a state, measure it, and then convert it to a clone and, and hope to uh, you know, continue the information. So these three form the pillar of quantum technologies today. In addition to that, I have to add one, which is called a topology, which is, comes in the material domain where a new material, which a new set of materials uh, or systems that are now being uh, built, uh, which have got properties which are very dis dis distinct in the, you know, in comparison to the first revolution material designs, where now we are using uh, new form forms of even entanglement, for example, uh, of properties in, uh, in designing materials that function very differently. So this has led to a different paradigms of material design. I am not sure which I will talk about or not, but we will see later. Okay, for those who are a bit uh, in this, already have done some reading, uh, I want to show you a, a, some form of a realization of quantum, uh, a qubit, for example, you create a two-state system, as I told you, our two states are here, and you put them in a cavity. Okay, a cavity can be of various types. I'm going to show you a picture of a cavity in a minute. And uh, this is, the cavity is very important because it now allows the two level system to interact with photons, okay? So if you take a Hamiltonian, and which is something like this, you have a quantum state of the two state system, which is called a qubit in the first part. And then you have the second one, which is called a coupling to the cavity, uh, and a parameter through G. And this allows manipulation of the quantum state using uh, microwave photons. Microwave photons are usually the domain of, of uh, you know, energy scale where you get this less spacing of the levels and hence you need microwave photons to make the state go back and forth, which leads to a manipulation of the quantum state that we're talking about. And this is how a qubit is created and then manipulated. You create by using a two-level system, creating a two-level system, and then you put that in a cavity with a lot of microwave radiation and microwave radiation allows you to manipulate the state of the qubit. That means if you look at the quantum state, it's cos theta by two multiplied by i sine theta by two. You can use microwave radiation to change this and this as a function of time. And hence, you know exactly which state you will go to by applying appropriate amount of microwave radiation. Okay? That's manipulation of the qubit. And this is where engineering comes into play, how you create multi-state quantum systems and, and uh, you know, what works, what doesn't work. This is a typical image or a picture of a superconducting transform qubit. As I said, uh, normally what happened, one of the major, actually the front runners in, in today's quantum computation uh, hardware platform are these Josephson junctions in a superconductor. And uh, in a superconductor, you have got a Josephson junction. Why do you use Josephson junction? Because it, Josephson junction gives you an immediately addressable two-state quantum system in a, in a, by forming a nonlinear harmonic potential well or nearly harmonic potential LC circuit, inductor capacitor circuit. We're not going to the detail here, but usually what happens is that you put in a Josephson junction 
in a cavity like this. This is an aluminium microwave cavity in which you put in the electron and uh, put in the Josephson junction. You address them by uh, microwave radiation through these ports, and you read out the state of the of the Josephson junction qubit using another port, which is essentially what I told you earlier about. You know, it, the microwave radiation couples the quantum state to the quantum state of the Josephson qubit and, ma and manipulates it by applying appropriate uh, pulses of micro, uh, uh, of the radiation gives rise to uh, gives rise to the you know qubit operation. Okay, um, using this basic platform, uh, 2019, the quantum supremacy was demonstrated by Google with a 53 qubit Sycamore processor, which dealt one task, which would otherwise take about 10,000 years by a state-of-the-art classical supercomputer that we uh, available, that is available today. But this superconductor qubits are certainly not the only uh, qubit platform. There are several of them. Some of them are, are here. For example, uh, the superconducting qubit, uh, the trapped ion qubit, the semiconducting qubit is very popular, a very uh, you know, uh, strongly researched system because you can do a large number of qubits in, through existing semiconductor technology. Uh, photon, photonic cluster states is extremely important and now photonic cluster states have already been uh, shown to surpass uh, certain classical tasks. And uh, uh, you know, that's one of the photonic quantum processor uh, are very important directions of research today. There are companies that have been formed um, and hopefully we'll see a significant uh, um, uh, development in that area very soon. Uh, one of the important aspects of photonic cluster states is that many of these are at room temperature, whereas superconducting qubits are usually in millikelvin temperature, in the very low temperature range in general, because you need to convert something to a superconductor. Uh, we also have designing the nitrogen vacancy centers and defect states in diamonds, uh, NMR quantum computation qubits. There are several uh, qubit platforms that are quite exciting and are, are being seriously being researched on. Okay. And um, now we have ERA, which is, uh, uh, you know, if you look at IBM uh, press release or website, you will see the, the papers. And there are, um, you know, clear direction in which we're moving. Maybe in 20, by 2023-24, we will hopefully will see uh, 1,000 qubit quantum processes. Um, so in some sense, these are quantum qubits which are prone to errors okay, because they are susceptible to decoherence. Now, if you really want a useful quantum computer in some sense, we have to go for correction of error corrections, which I'm going to come in the next slide, uh, or, or, or uh, at least, uh, you know, explain to you. And, uh, but what we can certainly say that we are in the era of uh, what we call noisy intermediate scale quantum processes in which individual qubits are, are noisy, but what we have shown that even with that, something useful can come up. So we don't have full error correction, but we have some basic platforms for of quantum uh, technology that have been in some, uh, uh, that have been put together and something useful can come up even with the present set of uh, state of technology. But if you really want to see the road ahead, uh, we are somewhere here, you can say, uh, after IBM, there have been uh, demonstrations from other uh, uh, agencies in China as well, uh, larger quantum uh, processors. But overall, if you look at it, that uh, where we will eventually be ending up probably in years from now, that useful error corrected quantum computation. Uh, but at this point of time, we are leading, we are, we are dealing with this area. So it's about uh, just quantum supremacy have been demonstrated. We have got uh, midterm applications which are happening. Hopefully next will be quantum error corrections. And then we get into the, you know, full quantum error corrected computer, which will happen hopefully in a decade or two. Okay, so this is about quantum computation. In case of quantum communication backbone, you have very similar kind of uh, architecture that I told you earlier, where you have a photon source or a single photon source, 
in which you create an entanglement set, for example, you know the state of the photons and then you send it to, to a channel. It could be a free space channel, it could be a fiber optic channel to the other person and the other person, Bob, essentially looks at the polarization or the state of the photon and you know, compares with what was, uh, what's there in the previous, where, where the source, and you get a quantum computation, a quantum communication uh, network, okay? I'll tell you where this is going, uh, the, the, the infrastructure that is being now built all over the world is there are four different directions in which quantum communication infrastructure is going to come through. Uh, first, the quantum cryptography, uh, integrated cryptography into the critical communication systems. Critical communication systems are those which, uh, you know, uh, you have communication to mobiles and other kind of uh, communication channels in which you start putting in quantum cryptography in it where security come through. Uh, you have, uh, you know, protection of data network and use the communication to synchronize clocks uh, in the case of e-voting and others, this could be immediately useful. Uh, you have also have to connect the combined terrestrial uh, and satellite uh, community components for a wide range of coverage. And then eventually these all gear up towards an era of what we call the quantum internet. But it's not easy because there's a huge amount of technical challenges that we need to overcome. For example, there are very few of them are listed uh, there are plenty of them. There are a lot of components that still need to be filled up before we get into a full-fledged quantum internet someday. For example, you need single photon detectors, which have to work in very fast speed key rate uh, of 10 to 100 megabytes per second, which is what typically the, the classical information works at, um, at very slow more time uh, resolution, 10 to 100 picosecond. You need to go very high efficiency and they have to operate at high temperatures. Today, these kind of uh, photon detectors are primarily at low temperature. Um, superconducting systems are used to detect photons. In addition, we need to have single photon sources with high efficiency, heralded single photon sources are those where you get the photon source whenever you want to. So as you keep on triggering, you should get up, get a single photon and with high efficiency. So this is also a, a key area that needs to be developed under the quantum technologies, under quantum communication and quantum technology in general. Of course, you need to have quantum memories and quantum repeaters, which are like to end up getting, if you want to have a long distance quantum uh, communication, you need to have storage where uh, uh, we need to have places where you can store their quantum information and then you amplify it or, and you, you you, uh, you know, record it and then you make it propagate. Uh, so quantum memories are important directions and also we do not have uh, a viable quantum memory and there's a lot of work going on to have, you know, both repeaters and memory which can be directly connected, uh, implemented in quantum communication uh, protocols. Third one, as I said, is the quantum sensing. And, and this is really fascinating about how quantum mechanical ideas can now lead to a completely new generation of sensing that simply wasn't possible uh, earlier before the engineering of quantum states started. For example, atomic sensors, you have navigation. I'll give you an example of how this works. The gravimeters, where radiometers, you me measure the Earth's gravity, G, extremely high accurately, highly accurately for different purposes. Dis displacement sensing, you heard about LIGO, you heard about gravitation wave detection, and that leads, that, that depends on the sensing tiny displacement of mirrors, right? For example, the uh, mirrors that needs, that you need, to, you need to measure displacement in the order of 10 power of minus 21 meters, and that's not easy. That's a very, very small number. So you need special techniques to to lead to such kind of accuracy in displacement sensing. Uh, you have atomic clocks, which I told you about time synchronization and communication uh, purposes. Magnetic sensing, you have uh, spin qubit sensors for imaging that will have fantastic magnetic uh, applications in medical imaging and others, uh, material characterization. I'll show you an example. 
and also of course uh, quantum state imaging with other electric field and other kind of um, you know light matter interaction or using ghost imaging where you see a different way of imaging that has not that that is now becoming possible. Okay, uh, let me give you two or three examples. Hopefully, that will tell you how the, the new technology is is being different from the old sensing techniques. Okay, so we all know what is interferences, right? For example, if you have a light coming in and you make light go through two different directions, one is mirror two, mirror one, and other is through mirror two. You have uh, then a, a second a detector which looks at the interference of this path of light and this path of light. Okay. Now, if these path, these two paths have got a phase difference, then the interference can lead to constructive interference when the two paths have got a zero or three sixty degree uh, phase difference with this delta phi. Then you have got a large amplitude at the detector, whereas if you are if the phases are anti massed or they are 180 degrees with respect to each other, then you have got destructive interference, and hence there will be no amplitude and there will be a zero signal at the detector. Okay? So the delta phi, the phase change, is essentially because there is a interference or a path that is being traversed, and the phase being generated because the wavelength is lambda. So the phase change is given by the difference in path different divided by the wavelength of the light or the wavelength of the wave that is going between this path and this path. Okay, so we all know this. Right, so what happens if we start playing around with it? And we play around usually interference is that of light. Okay, and the light is essentially having a wavelength of lambda, which is given by C divided by the frequency nu. But instead of light, if you have got atoms, okay, instead of light, and we know atoms are can be are, are waves as well in the representation, but there the wavelength is slightly differently expressed because we have mass, and the mass in a wavelength is given by the Planck's constant h divided by the mass of the atom and the velocity. Okay, now how we can use it is fascinating. You see, if I make the if I make a system, a beam splitter, which rotates slightly with a, some angular velocity, then a rotation shifts the position of the beam splitters, and that induces a path. And remember what I'm doing, I'm sending light uh, atoms, for example, through this. And that leads to a change in path length, and hence there is a change in phase because of the rotation. And that phase change is detected at the detector. And as I said, said, by changing the phase, the interference is changed and you can go from constructive to destructive interference. But what is interesting here is that because of the difference in the way the wavelength depends on the mass and the velocity, we have that if you use atoms instead of photons in this interferometer, we now get a rotation sensitivity given by mass of atom divided by the Planck's constant and the wavelength multiplied by C is in the orders of 5 to the power of 10. So typically, the phase change is 10 orders of magnitude more if you use an atom instead of a, instead of light. So that naturally makes your any kind of rotation sensitive to the gyroscope, for example, extremely sensitive to a new sense interfer atomic interferometry than usual optical interferometry that we have seen in our undergraduate labs and in schools and colleges. The same thing can actually be used in gravimeters or in, in gravity sensing. For example, there, if you look at this uh, side of the slide, if you want to have light going or atoms going in, and these atoms, because they are mass, right? You have got atoms with mass, so they have got gravity. And the change in velocity due to the local gravity will change in the wavelength because of through this equation, there's a change in velocity that changes the wavelength, and that will naturally lead to local change in the local phase because of the gravity. This basic idea is the uh, you know the platform to measure the acceleration due to gravity at extremely high precision with a ten to the power of nine minus nine uh, or changes in g by one in part in a billion, for example, can be done. What is an immediate effect, why we are excited, because now we can actually look at seismic events. 
and probably earthquake prediction or plate tectonics, plate movement, that is not possible. Even submarine detection, local perturbation uh, uh, in your, 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 your geosensitivity. So those kind of detection possibility becomes practical if you can create such high sense, such high sensitivity uh, gravimeters, for example. So this is something which uh, is all we are very excited about. I'll give you another example. And this is in sensing domain. And this is called Heisenberg limited quantum sensing. Um, how using quantum, we can get sensitivity that classical technologies is, is not, cannot get. So for example, if suppose you have an apple and you want to measure the length or the width of that for whatever reason. And you have a scale, okay? And the scale measures the width of that. And you gives, it gives you a length error. You take another scale and measure the same thing. So each scale is different, there's an error, right? So they all will come and give you a little, little different value. So L1, L2, L3, and then you've got N different scales, you get L, N different numbers. So then what you want to do, you want to know the average value of the apple value. And that can be coming as mean, which is nothing but sum of all L's and divided by the total number of measurements that you have done. And also the error, which is a classical error, is given by the variance, where you take each L, subtract from the mean N, and then you take the square of it divided by the N, and that is essentially a number that scales as the root of square root of the number of measurements that you have done. However, now imagine a situation which is quantum. That is where each of these scales are quantum mechanically entangled. So they are not really independent scales anymore, but they are quantum mechanically correlated in some manner. What can be theoretically shown in such cases is that the error, which was initially going as one over root n, will now go as one over n. And this is what we call the new uh, is Heisenberg limited sensing, in which now you have the delta L quantum divided by delta L classical, if you have 1 million uh, measurements, you will have better estimate or lower error by nearly a factor of thousands. And this is something which uh, is uh, you know, used in many applications in which you, or you would like to use in applications to improve the signal to noise uh, ratio in our next generation sensing for measurements. It will not be complete if I don't talk a little bit about magnetic sensing using vacancies in diamond, because this is such an important area of quantum technology that's coming up. Um, you have a very unique aspect in these vacancies. I have just given an example here, in which when you shine light on vacancies, which are vacancies of, uh, say, nitrogen vacancies in, in, in diamond, you have certain color that comes what you call as a emission from those nitrogen vacancies, okay? And these are strongly dependent on a tiny magnetic field, this color, essentially, if I apply a small magnetic field, then there is a state, quantum state, which splits into two, and that leads to a, you know, a two-state system, and the color can be manipulated by applying a little bit of microwave pulse between two states. Upshot of the story is that we now have uh, magnetic field sensitivity of a wide range of nanotesla to picotesla, and using magnetometers from different origins, we can have femtotesla sensitivity that can revolutionize the magnetic imaging, uh, the medical applications in particular, the magnetic resonance imaging, MRIs, where you see huge magnets in superconducting magnets, which can be completely uh, you know, revolutionized if we can have, have magnetic uh, imaging or magnetic sensitivity of such small, uh, of such high resolution. Uh, and of course, these are, uh, these can also be used as qubits because you can see these are essentially two state quantum systems. These can also be used in qubits computation at even room temperature. So these are, there is a lot of activities going on in this direction. Uh, you, these are in the commercial domain, it is getting into a strong manufacturing uh, directions now. These are, this is an image of a diamond tip sitting on cantilever 
which can be used for magnetic field sensing, uh, you know, for multiple purposes. It's such an important thing now that I have uh, given a rough state of the art what, where our quantum magnetometry comes into play. You can see the ni nitrogen vacancies are somewhere here. Of course, quids and uh, vapor cells, atomic that is using atoms, if we have very high sensitivity magnetometers, uh, but their sizes are a little larger. Whereas if you take magnetometry using nitrogen vacancies, they are slightly lower in sensitivity, but they can be small and you can actually hold them in your hands. So that's quite useful. Right, so uh, what I tried to give is that this is a uh, direction of quantum technologies that is going on uh, in globally now. There's a huge technological demand and I can show you, tell you that, you know, in case of superconducting qubits, there's a whole ideas of making, to make reasonably useful qubit, you need to have a large number of, uh, you know, a, a large superconducting wirings and multi-layer integrated circuits. So there is a huge amount of technological challenge that needs to be overcome. Uh, to give you an example here, you can see, even if I take a technology demand for making a single photon source, which can be used in a large number of uh, applications in quantum photonics, for example, detector photon, uh, you know, in integrated photonic waveguides, modulators, a huge number of technologies that is needed. If I take a single photon source as one of the key areas, you need extremely high performances uh, from these single photon sources. You need a fidelity of one, you need highly deterministic, that means every time you need a photon, it comes out. You need a spectral range of telecom wavelength of about 50, 50 nanometer. You need a large brightness where in a second you need megahertz, 10 to the power of six photons. There need to be multi-photon purity. You want one photon and not many in a pulse. You need to operate them at room temperature. They need to be indistinguishable. So there's, you can imagine the technological demand that you have to put in order to make quantum technology a reality and a day to the affair, you need to have devices and materials and systems of that time. Uh, as a result, there's a research. There's a lot of research going on in various directions and you have the spontaneous down conversion using nonlinear crystals. You have got four wave mixing, the quantum dots, nitrogen vacancies, there's a huge class of materials and systems that are being researched for to make even just a small aspect of quantum technology come through, like a single photon source. Uh, this led to materials research. I'm, I'm, uh, I can just flash this. I can show the quantum materials is one of the big directions and materials for quantum technologies. They are strongly connected. And there is a whole topological quantum materials is one direction. I'll not go into detail of that. There are new kind of superconductors that are being researched on, which have got a very unique property, uh, very different from what we have seen over the last hundred years. Two dimensional materials is one direction, engineering defects, new kind of superconductor, semiconductors are directions in which material research is continuing now, uh, which will enable uh, in quantum technologies in, in uh, various domains. Uh, for example, if you've got semiconductors, you can see uh, doped post silicon. You have uh, silicon germanium is one of the major directions in which uh, quantum qubits are, are being realized uh, because the defacing uh, nuclear uh, interactions, defacing the nuclear spins are seriously less in silicon, isotopically silicon germanium, silicon silicon and like one wells, which makes uh, qubit design uh, very promising indeed. Uh, of course, the two-dimensional materials, the, the uh, Indian 3-5 semiconductors are also important directions of this. Um, I want to, uh, I'll finish in the next five minutes or six, five to six minutes. However, I want to say, say a little bit, this has led to discoveries, okay? And this is what always happens. This leads to, leads to you start uh, certain directions of research because you want to achieve certain functionality that leads to one thing to the other and you lead to new, new discoveries. For example, when we started working on topological matter in which our goal initially was to make new superconductors or these superconductors could be superconductors with um, you know, very different pairing symmetry, which can have new X quasi particles or particles like Majorana fermions. And these Majorana fermions can lead to probably someday of 
fault tolerant quantum computation because they, you cannot deface uh, them because they are immune to local perturbation, defacing, for example. And the uh, error correction overhead is much lower. So you can make uh, easier uh, architectures from, uh, for quantum, quantum computation. Uh, so we wanted to have that kind of new particles. So there's a research to discover such particles. And uh, that led to new class of materials. Uh, there, there are many new materials. I'll not go into this, but I'll give you one example here. It is called a niobium phosphate. Why am I excited by this? Uh, these materials, where their electronic properties is unique because they can surpass disorder and they don't get scattered by disorder when electrons are moving in, these, in the bulk of these materials. As a result, these materials, if you look at this, this axis, this, this uh, number, this is called electrical mobility. And electrical mobility in these crystals can be as high as 10 to the power of 6, 10 to the power of 7 centimeters square per volt second. That leads to a very interesting direction because you see these materials are, uh, you know, maybe a few years old, two or three years old, uh, maybe five years old. If you look at the development of semiconducting technology, which is say, for example, based on gas L gas heterostructures, this is one of the highest uh, mobility semiconductors that you, are, that you get today. These mobilities, in order to get the mobility of this number, you had to wait from 19, you know, early 70s to 1990s. So it took maybe 20, 25 years to get mobilities, which you can now have materials of that electrical mobility. And, uh, you know, with these new paradigm of material design. Um, similarly, the two-dimensional material is also something that my group here works on on a on, on, uh, regular basis. You can make topological matter, you can make novel superconductor, you can make tailored magnetism, quantum emitters, then photon counters, um, volumeters, for which can work as in the quantum uh, electrodynamic regime. Uh, and then, of course, the spin defects, which can create for use for single photon emission. Right, so I would like to give a timeline I mean, where we are going to go and what is the time scale that we have to wait. If you look at the quantum technology timeline for quantum computation, uh, we have some noisy intermediate scale quantum computation processes now, which the decade that we see from now to 2030, for example, we probably are in this era of noisy intermediate scale quantum processes. A completely fault tolerant quantum processor, computer sitting on the table, that's going to take time. Uh, we still don't know who will win the race, which platform, but overall we are talking about 2030, 2025, maybe beyond that. Um, if you look at communication, as you said, the quantum key distribution and quantum random number generators is already in there. Uh, network, intra and intercity network will be coming somewhere uh, in the second half of 2020s and going towards 2025, 2030. Beyond that, probably will quantum internet is something which we would like to look for. In the sensing, we already have quantum atomic clocks are already in place. Uh, they are commercial systems, so that's there. But you can see there's a cluster of technologies that is happening at the lower or the nearer time scale, like the gravimeters and radiometers, uh, magnetometers, quantum imaging with light, the lidars, GPS free navigation. So these are directions in which probably we will have technologies coming up in a shorter time scale in the next decade, maybe decade and a half. Uh, and we will see a serious uh, enhancement of activities, uh, both fundamentally and commercially in this domain. As a result, there have been huge number of amount of uh, investment. There has been European quantum flagship. Uh, it has now been extended and enhanced in its context there are not just European quantum flagship of a billion euros, but there are individual countries which have got their own quantum program. And that's good, that is happening. Uh, you know, there's a huge enhancement, right, proliferation of the activities. Uh, United States have also already had the quantum national quantum initiative of, of 1.2 billion, 
dollars uh, in 2018, and then that's what, what, what's important in America is that there's a serious amount of private uh, contribution and initiation to get the quantum technology in, in uh, action. Google, IBM, Microsoft, Pagetti, there's a serious number of companies which are participating and promoting quantum technology in terms of communication and uh, computation and other platforms. Um, so is Japan. Uh, China is slightly unknown, uh, but overall, it could be a huge number. We already know that China has demonstrated uh, quantum communication uh, over the cities, Austria. So there's a huge investment in China regarding the you know, elite, uh, advancement of quantum technologies, particularly quantum cryptography and quantum radar and so on. Um, overall, if you look at quantum efforts worldwide, and you see that it stands at hopping estimate of nearly $22 billion. Uh, you can see uh, roughly over here, India sitting here, uh, there has been an announcement of this, I'll show you in a minute, uh, where we are, but overall you can see different countries uh, have got a huge uh, investment of quantum technologies uh, globally. And this is going to grow because I have assured these can do purpose, things, serve purposes that needs a new technological platform. There's a huge intellectual property, race in intellectual properties uh, that's coming up. For example, China, you can see 2018 has surpassed the United States. There are other EU countries as well, South Korea, Japan. There's a lot of activities in creating intellectual property uh, for quantum technologies. Um, companies are coming up. This is something which is increasing. I don't, I have the, uh, the data of 2018 here. Uh, you can see the, the total value of the, D, of the cash that is being put in in the private sectors. Um, so one important aspect, and I would like to uh, finish this talk with an, uh, a slide that I borrowed from, I got from Tommaso Calarco, uh, the head of, uh, or uh, coordinator of uh, European flagship. Uh, how the development of quantum technologies occurred since the famous statement of uh, Feynman about in 1980s on the, uh, you know, quantum can become a technology because you need to understand, in order to understand quantum, you need to use quantum. And you can see from 1990, 1990 you have uh, EU investments, then you have uh, DWA was found, the quantum simul uh, simulators, of, and then, you can see a very interesting hand-in-hand -in -hand development of uh, the state funding and the private sectors taking up the technology and pushing it forward. And uh, this is particularly true in the last two years or so. You can see a clustering of activities somewhere here. Uh, so this essentially, the reason I stopped here is because also at this point of time, India announced its own quantum technology program. So you have uh, SK Telecom, you have Microsoft coming in for with the, with the station queue in 2005 with, for, for my runner based qubits. And then we have got one qubit, we've got Australian government coming in, we have Canadian government, we have got uh, EU essentially coming in 2018 with the flagship. And in the bottom, you have got how IBM has gone up and Google's and, and you know, Accenture, Allianz, there's a huge number of companies now who are interested and who are looking to, to support the development of quantum technologies. We now have one here uh, in India now, which has been announced which hasn't started formally yet, but hopefully it will soon uh, with the, with the you know, PT of nearly a billion. And there we are talking about uh, quantum computation and simulation, quantum communication, quantum sensing metrology and quantum materials as the key platforms for this national mission where we would like to see research and entrepreneurship and, and uh, 
translation to devices to go hand in hand. We would like to compete with the technologies in all different areas of uh, domains that I, I, that I told you about. Um, and, and this requires a strong collaboration between material science, physicists, engineers, and various other uh, you know, science domain, science uh, and technology domains, uh, clearly saying that one needs to come out of conventional understanding or conventional uh, paradigm of research and you really get into interdisciplinary research in the years to come. I'm going to stop here and if there are questions that I'm very happy to answer. Thank you, Arindam. Wonderful talk. We all uh, enjoyed. Uh, there are plenty of questions uh, which we have collated from both uh, the Zoom chat and also the uh, chat in uh, YouTube. So I'll, I'll start off by a couple of questions uh, which we're trying to understand what is quantum mechanics uh, itself. So the first question is by Vinyas and uh, the question is what is the meaning of the word quantum? Okay, the meaning of quantum is uh, if you look at uh, any excitation or any particle, uh, let's, let's, not go into, let's not go into detail of the word. So if you take light, for example, then you can look at light as a wave and you can also look at light as a, a single entity of a, or a particle. So the fact that you can look at, uh, you know, identify the light as a single entity with well-defined energy, unit of energy, is called a quantum of light. Okay, so that's what they call a photon. It's a quantum of light. Similarly, if you look, like electrons is also quantum because electrons can also be waves, but also it can be at a particular energy or it can look at the particle. So, a well-defined energy state is probably how I would look at quantum. Thank you. So there are two questions which are probably related to the point that you were discussing about entanglement. So first question is by Prakash Sarangi about how do we entangle photons. A related question is by Deepali and she's wondering how is it possible that uh, two uh, states on different planets uh, can become completely different? Ha, right. So, okay. Uh, the second question is far more difficult to answer. The first question is relatively easier. There are ways in which you can create entangled photons. Uh, one of the first, one of the example is using nonlinear crystals, for example. So in which you say, for example, you, you use one photon to create two photons simultaneously, right? So say, for example, you, you have a single photon uh, of energy E. You send it to another, a, a nonlinear crystal, and you get two photons from that use of energy E by two and E by two. So since it comes from the same photon through some nonlinear physical process in the system, the two photons that come out will be entangled or can be entangled. So there are nonlinear crystals that can do the job. Okay. Uh, so for example, you can have the two Two, one linearly polarized photon leading to two circularly polarized photons. So they now, if you, they can be right circularly polarized and other can be left circularly polarized. So if you now take these circular polarization as the red and the blue that I showed you earlier in the balls, then if you send one photon to Jupiter and other photon to Mars, till you measure it, they will be as a coherent superposition of left and right polarization. But if you measure one photon in Mars, that it is in left circularly polarized state, the one in Jupiter will have to be in the right circularly polarized state. And that determined by the entanglement. Thank Why you. entanglement? That, that is something which is a domain of quantum mechanics. And that's a spooky property of quantum mechanics, which uh, is difficult to explain from an intuitive viewpoint. There are several questions on, on those uh, lines. Um, this is a question by Deepan. Um, can entanglement of non-commuting observables, such as position and momentum, can they take place? And uh, would that violate the Heisenberg uh, uncertainty principle? I don't know. I mean, I don't think so. No, I mean, it's uh, if you have, uh, this is something which needs to be discussed separately. Uh, uh, so if you take, normally we look at uh, entanglement of 
polarization, for example, uh, of the same observable. And uh, we have, uh, um, you know, polarization of uh, our spin state, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, if you take spin X uh, of state X and Z, they are non-commuting, but so I do not know whether that, I don't see entanglement to be relevant there, but uh, other people can have better understanding. Uh, I look at, say, for example, spin Z photons, uh, electrons of spin up and spin down, which are both Z component, and look at the entanglement of that in our measurements, for example. So we use uh, uh, use uh, entanglement of the commuting uh, uh, observables as far as technologies are concerned, as far as, as, far as I know. Uh, another question. Uh along the same fundamental aspects of quantum mechanics. Garvit Bansal asks, uh, why does the state collapse when you measure it? Right, so uh, that's again uh, an unique property of quantum mechanics that you, till you measure it, it can stay in n different states uh, where the states are, you know, dependent upon the Schrodinger's equation that governs the, that governs the quantum mechanics of the, of the system. Uh, but the moment you measure it, you will make once you will measure it in one of the states. So this, you immediately uh, freeze the quantum state in one of the eigenstates of the system. So uh, this is the basic paradigm of quantum mechanics. Um, so we have to, we accept it and we move on. Uh, yeah, thank you. A uh, couple more questions uh, going into the technological aspects. Uh, Deepan asks, are there any, uh, is there any superconductivity of particles with charges other than electromagnetic charges? Um, uh, so, so, right, so superconductivity is, is an electronic phenomenon in some sense. So, uh, so can you repeat the question again? What, what other than... Uh, so the, I, I think I'm sort of, I'll try to rephrase it. Is there a phenomenon of superconductivity for particles which are not electrically charged, but maybe have other kinds of charges? Well, I mean, if you take a look at uh, not superconductivity, but Bose-Einstein condensation and similar kind of uh, phenomena, then you also have a condensation into a coherent state. So superconductance is after all a coherent state of matter, right? It's a large number of particles essentially condensing into one macroscopic coherent state. And because of that coherence, the electrical resistance vanishes. Um, so there are other evidences of such quantum states. Bose-Einstein condensate is one perfect example in which you go to very low temperature where the atoms essentially condense into a coherent state. So there you don't have charge, but you still have a coherent state of uh, you know, neutral species. So I don't think superconductivity is the right word, but macroscopic coherence answer is yes. Right. Uh, there are a couple of questions uh, where people are wondering what are beam, slip, uh, beam splitters? Uh, so this is by Debashish Raut and uh, another person. I missed the name. Uh, yeah, Devanshu Sekar. How do beam splitters, atomic beam splitters or photonic beam splitters, what are they? How do they act? Oh, beautiful. So beam splitters are essentially, uh, you can call it as half silver mirror, for example. You take a, you have mirror, for example, and you take light to fall and you, you you put uh, on the back of the mirror some reflector, maybe some silver coating, and you make it in such a way that you make part of the beam trans transmit from the other side, and other part gets reflected. And uh, so the, the engineering here is essentially how to make the coating so it just divides the incoming beam into parts. It's as simple as that. Of course, in the case of atoms, it's far more complex and far more involved. That's something which people who are working in uh, atomic uh, interferometry will be able to answer using lasers and using certain uh, assembly of lasers. One can one can do that uh, in, in the case of atoms. But optics is relatively well defined and well understood. Right. Um, Shubha Prata Chakraborty asks, uh, "What's the advantage of microwave radiation or other frequencies uh -huh. for coupling in the cavity?" Beautiful question. So. You see, microwave is essentially the kind of energy scale where we have been able to engineer our quantum two-level systems. 
most of the two state system that we see uh, around us in um, in uh, various domains of quantum technology whether it is quantum computation quantum sensing quantum metrology quantum uh, yeah even communication and communication of course is done with light uh, uh, optical radiation in either visible or in infrared but uh, in quantum sensing and quantum computation the two level system say for example uh, silicon uh, uh, is if you take a look at superconducting quantum uh, system where you need to have uh, the energy level spacing and a little bit of enharmonics energy level spacings are in the order of few gigahertz a few uh, you know uh, milli electron volts and and uh, uh, a few yeah few gigahertz right so uh, that comes to microwave frequency similarly if you look at diamond uh, as a quantum sensor you see by applying a tiny magnetic field you open up the open up the levels uh, the spin one level and that also opens up by an amount in the order of few gigahertz and and microwave frequency so it turns out that most of the systems that we deal with with in the quantum technology the energy scales are in the orders of uh, gigahertz uh, or the microwave frequency range which is why microwave engineering is one of the key aspects of quantum technologies uh, today um, and and we need to understand how microwave interacts with such quantum systems in a cavity uh, the couple more questions on uh, some fundamental aspects of quantum mechanics itself. So Rutuja is asking, can it be said that quantum states have superposed values because the quantum entities, atoms, electrons, instance, have high entropy or is there some other physics at play? Um, Vijay, can you repeat the question? I forgot yeah, the first. Yeah. So I think she's wondering, uh, do they have superimposed values because the entities have very high entropy? Um, the, the, I'm, I'm trying to rephrase it. I don't know if that is what she meant. If she's that, she can ask. She's trying to probably wonder super, superposition and yeah, I thought entropy, entropy, for instance. Well, I mean, uh, the entropy is, of course, one of the key aspects in uh, even in quantum description. Uh, but I would rather not connect them at this stage because I would like to simply say that superposition principle, the what we use in quantum technologies is, you know, if we have two states, uh, which we, uh, in a two state system, but of course it could be multiple states. Um, and then we have, uh, you know, we, we, these are two eigenstates of the system and they're orthogonal. So they, they don't mix, right? Um, but we can we can manipulate them by making the electron or the system uh, be in, the, in a superposition state the way we want. Uh, I'm not sure whether this answers the question, but uh, you know whether entropy is connected here for as far as the technological purposes, I'm not sure. So some are applications of uh, quantum technology. So Parisaraya wonders whether quantum technologies are applicable to understand ecology. Uh, uh-huh. And, uh, and Anu Anuja wonders whether they're useful in computational chemistry, for instance. Oh, yes, of course. Right. So um, one is talking about future applications and, of course, developing technology. Ecology, uh, quantum chemistry, of course, uh, one of the if you take the quantum chemistry or, 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 or some domain of chemistry, for example, combinatorial chemistry, which can lead to uh, new uh, kinds of chemicals, which kinds of compounds, for example, designing material, designing uh, drugs, various kinds of molecules, um, quantum computation probably will be very useful because you then look at, uh, you know, the stability and uh, you design compound with necessary functionality. That's where computation probably comes into play. As far as ecology is concerned, that is a little different ballgame where ecology probably will require a sensing of certain uh, environmental parameters where, um, you know, which, which, which can be sensed, which, uh, I don't know, for, for example, if one looks at geology and, and looks at envi- en- environmental change because of 
tectonic movements which is continuously happening and one could look at the uh, gravimeters or geosensors which leads to some form of uh, trend in the future leads to uh, or allows us to probably project how uh, ecology is going to uh, be affected by by uh, geo sense uh, you know uh, geological changes at the large scale uh, over over time so there could be there could be uh, changes in vegetation there could be changes in local uh, climate so for those you need to have proper sensors installed and the geo gradiometer the geo sensors these are probably very useful uh, techniques with which uh, such data can be uh, obtained and monitored so eventually answer is yes uh, Anirbha and Roy Chaudhary uh, wonders what causes efficiency to be low in quantum technology systems and uh, what can one do to uh, increase the efficiency? Okay, so I think the question comes from uh, um, single photon or yeah. uh, generated resources. Uh, so, well, I mean, so the, there are different uh, different realizations of these even quantum photon uh, quantum single photon sources or detectors there are uh, sources with extremely high efficiency up to 83 percent 85 90 percent um, there are sources which uh, are low efficiency but high speed for example so what we require is uh, is a combination of all these parameters in a single body so for example in the case of single photon sources you need single photon source to be uh, or single photon detectors, you need every photon that comes and hits the detector to be detected. So efficiency needs to be 100%. But then such detectors can become very slow. So you, if you want to make a uh, you know, series of photons, uh, one after the other coming at a fast speed, then this detector is not ready before, after taking one photon, it is not ready to take the same next photon. So there the time scale comes into play. So, you see, one needs to have photon so detectors in which all these properties must be simultaneously achieved in order to make them immediately you know, applicable for quantum technology purposes. Mm -hmm. So it is not that we do not have sensors with very high efficiency, but it is more of a, compute, a combination of all these properties mm -hmm. that must come to. And that's where research is done. Yeah. So Parth Patil has a relative. What do you mean by when you say qubits are noisy? Okay. Qubits are noisy simply because of decoherence. And because now, for example, uh, if a typical operation uh, needs, so this is where the circuit depth and all are so important. When you when you make a quantum circuit or, or, or a multi qubit processor, um, where you every qubit is is prone to decoherence because it's continuously interacting with its environment. Okay, the the coherence time is. Can, for example, a superconducting qubit coherence time is in the order of a millisecond. So, if you take, um, you know, a typical gate operation of a few microseconds or so, then you can do certain number of application. But even in the, uh, gate per, gate uh, operations, but even there, you, because of the continuous decoherence or or losing of the quantum information your output will not be the same as what would be for a perfect quantum system with entire mm -hmm. coherent properties intact okay and hence the results will be noisy and this is what i mean uh, because of uh, a noisy uh, quantum processor asif shah wonders can you give some directions how 2d materials are being used for making qubits okay uh, 2d materials is a relatively new field in terms of engineering aspects because initially uh, the field was more developed in the material and, and things like that but yes now there are various uh, directions in which uh, two-dimensional materials can be made qubits from uh, graphene is one of the most advanced material in 2d which uh, probably can be uh, there are qubit there are quantum dots which can which has been created in uh, in uh, with uh, graphene, bilayer graphene in particular, and these quantum dots can be uh, a platform for qubits. There are other uh, qubit uh, realizations as well. For, for example, using superconducting properties, one has uh, possible realizations of transform qubits based on two-dimensional materials. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there are a few 
technological a uh, few directions in which 2d materials can be used uh, as qubits uh, but these are at a very very early stage the couple of questions um, in fact more questions on some fundamental aspects of quantum mechanics i'll read out a couple of them anupam medirata asks uh, what is the intuition to understand hilbert space right so hilbert space is well, it's a, it's a term at the end of the day i mean once you still uh, and so, so there are certain terms which you cannot avoid using i guess but it's the it's the number of states a quantum system can assume or can live in for example uh, if you take spin up and spin down it's a two it's, it's, there are just two states up and down so that's from the hilbert space of a single spin now if you got large number of spins each of them going back and uh, can go as say for some reason you have a quantum system in which your superposition you remove the superposition and you have got just up state and down state of possible states then you will have n states then you will have a hilbert space of 2 to the power of n but of course if you a quantum system is a superposition of states so that means a hilbert space is very very large it can stay in many many states so a hilbert space is a space in which a quantum state can reside I think that's the easiest way I can think. I can say. I agree, I agree. So he goes on to ask, how can you store quantum information? Isn't that violating the no cloning theorem? Very good question. Actually, um, if you think about it, I mean, that's one of the counterintuitive things of making a quantum repeater or quantum memory or something like that. those kind of things. Where you, how do you, if you cannot clone, then how do you store and then read it later and then send it somewhere else, right? So, yeah, I mean. There are ways in which in which uh, in which such uh, actions can probably be performed. Um, so th th there are also several methods in which uh, weak measurements and and various other techniques in which uh, a quantum system can be read without uh, damaging it too much. For example, um, as far as quantum measurements are concerned, it's relatively well defined. But uh, yeah, so for memory, one needs to look at the protocols with the atomic, uh, you know, the gases. There are ways in which uh, some of the systems can store the quantum information. Um, needs a little bit more involved answer, so I don't think I'll be able to answer it fully here. Okay, the many more questions, uh, but uh, Rahul Kumar wonders. Um, Without any resolution in the open issues in the interpretation of quantum mechanics, why are we confident that there are any properties that can be exploited for computation in practice? Uh, without any first part. So, so we, we have lots of issues in the interpretation of quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. and still we feel confident enough that we can exploit oh. some properties and can do computation. Why are we doing that? Well, I don't think one should talk about issues in uh, interpretation. I think we have. We have more or less have agreed that uh, there are certain non-trivial aspects of quantum mechanics that's going to be there and we need to learn to live with it. Uh, what we have done over the last decades, uh, last few decades is understand those non-trivial issues and we know how they behave. And we now are in a position to use them and quantum technology is using them. So I think, I think uh, we will simply stop asking why they occur but we just say that okay, they occur and we use them. So that's the that's the approach we should take. Okay, there's several more questions, but I thought I'll end with these two questions, which might be more relevant. So there are two questions by Supreet and uh, Jaydi Pradi. So Supreet asks, uh, do you see a product in quantum technology being developed by an Indian student from a normal college, and can he make a living out of that? And uh, yes. Jaydi has a related question uh, for a student who is in BTech. Uh, where do we start off and how do I make a career in this field? Okay, um, so quantum, uh, the, to answer the first question, uh, yes, I think uh, it indeed is possible. There are two aspects that you need to remember. I mean, look, quantum, if you look at quantum com technology in general, there are four different uh, areas. I'll take example of quantum computation, for example. Uh, of, this is similarly true for other the verticals of quantum technology as well. If you look at quantum computation, there is a there are two aspects of computation. One is theoretical aspects, another is practical hardware aspect. Um, the theoretical aspect deals with uh, you know algorithms, creating new algorithms, creating new uh, uh, platforms 
which can not only uh, have a direct impl uh, implication for quantum uh, computers, uh, it is also uh, in going into the regime of machine learning, it could artificial intelligence, but, and also there are new protocols for uh, dealing with the post quantum cryptography uh, era. So I, I think one, you know, a, even a basic computer science language uh, or, or background can eventually lead to a very strong impact in quantum technology. So you can, and that can happen within India, for example, we, we do not have Although that's happening now, uh, the hardware is being developed in India uh, in terms of uh, quantum technology computation and other verticals as well. So you can have a direct uh, participation in both quantum, in both theoretical and experimental uh, quantum uh, technologies. And the background is now being taught in various, uh, in, I mean, there are computer science, mathematics, physics everywhere, and that background is more than enough to get started. Um, and, you know, even if in, with those minimal background, you should be able to participate and contribute to uh, the, the growth of quantum technology. And the, as I showed you the in the, in the slide here, I mean, look at the number of companies that have either spawned out of the quantum technology um, uh, concepts or the number of companies that uh, have contributed or part or, 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 or invested in quantum technologies. And, and hence, I feel that there is a very strong career option uh, that's going to grow uh, in the years to come. I hope this answers both questions. Yeah. Thank you, Arindam. That was a wonderful talk. We thoroughly enjoyed uh, your perspectives on quantum technologies and what looks like a bright future in this area. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thank you for accepting this invitation and giving a wonderful talk. Let's all th join hands to clap and uh, thank digitally, however you can. Uh, thanks. Before we end, I have a small announcement. The upcoming KDK talk, uh, the next one will be on September 19th, Sunday. 4 p.m. and uh, it will be by Geeta Venkatraman from Ambedkar University and the title will be on uh, the art and science of secret messages, some glimpses. So do stay tuned and uh, do catch up on the announcements appropriately. Thanks Arindam, wonderful. Thank talk. you, Vijay. Thank See you later. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you everyone. Take care and stay safe.